these scales, and I think it's simply a reflection of the extraordinary range of Lynn's interest that we're going from the, the planetary uh, to the cellular scale. Uh, but what I always enjoyed about uh, a lecture by Lynn was the videos of cells doing things uh, together and interacting with each other and actually seeing them. And uh, my feeling about her is that she was primarily a visual scientist. <laughs> that, that, that if she saw something, um, she, she, she believed it. And I think that's why she held so tenaciously to her idea about the spirochetes and the, uh, and the uh, eukaryotic flagellum, because she could see it in the symbiotic uh, 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 pictures that she showed. Uh, taken out of cockroach intestines and, and so forth. So, uh, let me give you the take-home messages to begin with, and I think that will help uh, make uh, uh, where I'm going a little clearer. And I also want to encourage people that if I take something for granted that's technical and it doesn't make sense to you, please ask so that I can avoid uh, uh, confusing you rather than, than enlightening you. So, uh, the take home messages are, uh, rather than the, the DNA being the boss of the cell, uh, the cell is the boss of the genome. And the genomes are systems, organized systems that are under cell control. And they're definitely not collections of atomistic agents called genes. I think the gene concept is, is uh, uh, on its way out, uh, even though the terminology will survive, I think, indefinitely. Uh, the second point is that, uh, contrary to the conventional view that the genome is a read-only memory that changes only by accidents, in fact, cells are capable of writing information into their genomes uh, at all time scales, and I'll explain that. And they can restructure their genomes actively. So genomes are actually read-write memory systems, and I think that that's a, a critical point uh, if we're going to understand how evolutionary change actually occurs. Uh, the third point is that, uh, uh, again, contrary to the conventional wisdom that increasing reproductive fitness is the key thing, uh, I don't think that uh, natural selection does much more than get rid of misfits. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace thought of it as a, uh, a governor, like on a steam engine, that kept things pretty much the same. Uh, the real issue and the key problem in evolution science is where does novelty come from? Where does innovation come from? And typically, today, we're in the age of systems biology. Uh, we think of all uh, characteristics of the organism as being the expression of systems that have come from the genome. Uh, and so how do new systems come into being? and new components of systems come into being is, is the problem. And then finally, uh, I hope to at, at least convince you that this is a, a, uh, a realistic uh, point of view that needs to be investigated, is that cells are active cognitive participants in evolutionary innovation. Uh, they have sensory and signal transduction networks, which they use to control many of their activities. Uh, as we'll see, natural genetic engineering uh, is a, a catch-all for the, 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 the activities that cells have to cut and splice and otherwise change their DNA. And that's responsible for genetic change, not accidents. And uh, finally, we have epigenetic regulation, and we're just beginning to learn about how that interfaces with uh, uh, cell sensitivity, cell response to uh, life history events, and the control of genome restructuring.
So those are the, the, the take home lessons, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, the lecture makes sense in terms of uh, uh, those points. So uh, Lynn, uh, of course, uh, was most famous for arguing for symbiogenesis. And that's a kind of rapid change which is totally inconsistent with the gradualistic change that Darwin <coughs> envisaged. And it's only gradualistic change which could ever be guided by natural selection to pr produce anything uh, new. Once you have rapid changes, you're presenting selection with a new a novelty, a major novelty, and Either it will work or it won't work, but the creative business has already been done by the time selection gets <coughs> out of the novelty. She, uh, of course, uh, uh, her reputation was established mostly on, on the, the eukaryotic cell being a symbiogenetic product uh, and then photosynthetic symbiogenetic uh, cells being products of further symbiogenetic, uh, uh, being products of the second symbiogenesis. And as we've learned, uh, uh, the people who do this, there have been many secondary and tertiary symbiogenetic events in the eukaryotic uh, lineage. Uh, there's a review that I'll, I'll show, I think I show a reference to it by Emily and Martin a number of years ago, which uh, documents this. So symbiogenesis is an ongoing process. There are endosymbionts all over the, the, the world, and we have yet to come to terms with how widespread symbiogenesis uh, is. Uh, 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 Jan talked about Wolbachia and uh, endosymbionts in, in arthropods and insects. Uh, they go for the gonads typically, so they get in the germline, and they have profound effects on reproduction and mating, and are, are powerful agents for uh, a rapid evolutionary change. And Jan also fortunately talked about uh, uh, horizontal DNA transfer. Oh, excuse me. Uh, when you have genome mergers and integration uh, in symbiogenesis, two cells come together. Uh, there is an issue of what happens to the genomes in the newly formed symbiogenetic cell. But we know that DNA gets transferred between the multiple genome compartments that are found in those cells. And so, there, so there's horizontal DNA transfer between those different cell DNA uh, compartments and most of the proteins, for example, in the mitochondrion and also in the chloroplast or plastids, as they're called, are encoded in the nuclear genome, indicating that they've been transferred from the endosymbiotic bacteria to the nucleus. And that, in itself, how it happens and uh, what triggers it and what determines what functions are, are selected is an interesting question. Uh, uh, the the last point I want to make about symbiogenesis, and this is where we come into the cognitive issues, uh, which will pop up uh, repeatedly in the course of the, the lecture, because I thought this was a good audience to emphasize that, is how are the two cell cycles of the two cells which merge integrated together so that the host cell doesn't outgrow to the endosymbiont or the descendant of an endosymbiont, and also so that the endosymbiont doesn't overgrow the host and kill it. How are they maintained? And what we know about eukaryotic cell cycles, and this is just a, a, a cartoon of the cell cycle, is that it proceeds in a fairly well-defined process. Uh, I believe it's the right way. Yeah, through several phases. So as soon as the cell divides, uh, the, the, the new daughter cell goes through an initial growth phase, G1, and then there's a period of DNA synthesis called the S phase, and then the second growth phase, and then the phase of mitosis, which has well-defined substages such as metaphase and anaphase, and then the process of cytokinesis, which is the actual 
separation of the two daughter cells. And uh, the cell cycle has been the subject of a great deal of research. Uh, the Nobel Prize was given, I think, for cell cycle research in 2009, I believe, to Lee Hartwell and Paul Nurse, and I forget the third person. Um, Lee Hartwell is the one who really began the genetics of this. And what we know about the cell cycle is that uh, it is a cognitively controlled process. The cell cycle is uh, one of the most complex synthetic or biosynthetic or reproductive processes we know. It involves literally hundreds of millions of biochemical and biomechanical events. Uh, it involves various stages, all of which have to be synchronized and coordinated so that they occur together. And uh, what Hartwell uh, came up with uh, through studying actually responses to DNA damaging agents, uh, he came up with the concept of checkpoints. That is, that as the cell proceeds through the cell cycle, checkpoints are in place so that if one stage of the process is not complete when it's time for the next process to begin, that second process is held up until the first process is begun. The cell monitors itself and emits signals which leads to blocks in emissions of the following steps until everything is in place for that to happen. And here is a, 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 a convenient illustration of this uh, taken from a, a paper on yeast, budding yeast, this is the normal uh, uh, cell cycle that's unperturbed. The, the, the cell is one through G1 and S phase and G2. The chromosomes are aligned upon the spindles. One, hat, one set of chromosomes, duplicated chromosomes, will go into the daughter bud. The other will stay in the mother cell. And if everything is lined up properly, then the cell undergoes cytokinesis and splits apart, and the chromosomes are pulled apart and you have two, two cells produced. But if the spindle is not properly aligned, as illustrated here, or if all of the chromosomes are not properly lined up on the spindle, the cell senses that. There are uh, monitoring devices, which I'll we'll get to in just a second, which send out signals which say, don't divide because you might produce a bug which has no genome. And so uh, until the, the problem can be corrected, uh, the cell stays in this pre-division stage. And then when the orientation of the spindle or the alignment of the chromosomes on the spindle has been corrected, then the checkpoint is released and the cell can undergo division. And molecular genetics has enabled us to identify a whole series of different proteins, some of which are cell cycle control proteins like CDC20, some of which are specific uh, uh, checkpoint proteins like BUB and these BUB proteins, the MAD proteins. And we, we, we know from molecular studies that all of these proteins form a network that they can stick to each other, they can interact, we can do genetic studies and remove them one at a time and show that the, the uh, inhibitory blocking activity is, is disrupted. But we don't have a clue as to how they really process the information which comes off of the abnormal, improperly arranged spindle. And I argue that this is a cognitive process that this is the cell making a decision based upon information it receives, in this case about internal processes, not the external uh, environment. So that's one kind of cognition. I, I think the next slide actually illustrates a simpler kind of cognition. But these networks, which uh, we know about, there are lots of diagrams of them. They seem to be very complex. They have many players. We've identified the components. We can do biochemistry on it, but we still lack a real understanding of how they operate in a, as I would argue, cognitive decision-making 
way. Um, so I, I'm, I thought I had I seem to have lost the slide which I thought was in here, which was cognition in DNA proofreading. Uh, let me just tell you about it because it's easy to describe. Uh, if the replication apparatus makes a mistake, and it, it does make mistakes, and it incorporates the wrong uh, nucleotide, it, it has two levels of proofreading. The, the enzyme itself will stop and back up, remove remove the improper nucleotide and then start up again. That's called exonuclease proofreading. But there's a post-replication mismatch repair process. And uh, what happens when an incorrect base is incorporated in the DNA is the cell has a protein which goes along the DNA and detects that. And in E. coli, that protein is called MUT-S for mutation S because if you lack it, you have a higher spontaneous mutation rate. You can't correct these incorporation errors. And that's a detection protein, and once it binds to a mismatched base pair, it changes its activity and actively recruits two other proteins, MUT-L and MUT-H, to come in to form a complex. And then MUT-H cuts the new strand and it's removed by a protein which unwinds DNA, which is called the helicase. And then the cell can repolymerize the excised region and remove the air, doing that accurately because the size is quite small. So if you have two levels of proofreading, the precision of E. coli DNA replication is less than one mistake per billion incorporations. But the polymerization system is only accurate to one in a hundred thousand. So we have another factor, uh, uh, or one in ten, of, yeah, one in a hundred thousand. So we have another factor of at least ten thousand in accuracy, which is due to this proofreading monitoring system. The two of them, and both of those, I would argue, are again cognitive uh, systems. So the, 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 the cell pays attention to its genome, controls what happens to it, controls how it behaves through the cell cycle and through DNA replication. And I could go on and, and bore you with many more examples like that. Uh, but let's go on uh, to another aspect uh, of what the cell does with its genome. And talk about one of the most fascinating and still misunderstood scientists of the 20th century, Barbara McClintock. Uh, as a young scientist, after she had uh, been the first person to show that uh, the physical structure of the chromosome corresponds with the genetic maps that were produced by recombination analysis, and got a lot of fame for that. She went to Missouri to study Lewis Stadler's X-ray induced mutants in maize. And she found out that these were not at all gene mutations, that the mutants were actually uh, uh, maize plants which had chromosome rearrangements. And what the X-rays had done uh, was induce double strand breaks in the DNA. And the May cells were capable of detecting those double strand breaks and repairing them by joining two broken ends together. Today we call this non homologous end joining, and we know quite a bit of, again about its molecular biology. Uh, the way she proved this was by showing that certain unstable mutants had ring chromosomes which lacked telomeres. And if they replicated and then recombined, they would form a double ring which would behave abnormally at cell division and be lost. And um, this was poo-pooed by a number of her colleagues, but she went out and showed that it was true. So uh, McClintock found that what were thought to be, quote, gene mutations were in fact chromosome rearrangements. And at the same time, she demonstrated that the cells could repair this damage to their DNA. This was the first discovery of self-repair 
of the genome by, by, by cells. Uh, she went on in the 1940s to uh, the early 1940s to experimentally induce breaks in the chromosomes and find uh, that uh, uh, no matter when she made the breaks, if the cell had two broken ends, it would bring them together and join them. And her Nobel Prize speeches lecture is quite extraordinary because she was given the Nobel Prize for discovering mobile genetic elements, transposable elements. And she doesn't talk at all in that speech about how she demonstrated that there are transposable elements. She talks about her early research and how the elements were activated. And she emphasizes um, the cell as, as I say here, a self-sensing, self-repairing entity. She said, from summing up those experiments in her, in her Nobel lecture, the conclusion seems inescapable that cells are able to sense the presence in their nuclei of ruptured ends of chromosomes. Telomere ends are, are different. And then to activate a mechanism that will bring together and then unite these ends one with another. The ability of a cell to sense these broken ends, to direct them toward each other, and then to unite them so that the union of the two DNA strands is correctly oriented, is a particularly revealing example of the sensitivity of cells to all that is going on within them. There must be numerous homeostatic adjustments required of cells. The sensing devices and the signals that initiate these adjustments are beyond our present ability to fathom. And even though we know a lot more about these processes, that, that statement still holds. A goal for the future would be to determine the extent of knowledge the cell has of itself and how it utilizes this knowledge in a thoughtful manner when challenged. And so that's from her Nobel Prize lecture, and this was picked up by Dennis Bray in his 2009 book, which is unfortunately out of print, called Wetware, A Computer in Every Living Cell, as being the first statement by a biologist asking what does a cell know about itself. So uh, that was Barbara's conclusion from the uh, uh, DNA breakage experiments. She went on with these experiments to ask what does a cell do when it gets one broken end? And what she found was that cells have a tough time dealing with a single broken end, uh, but ultimately they can uh, survive, and many of the cells that survived contained the elements, that, like this element called DS for dissociation, which led to chromosome breakage, uh, that were transposable, because she could follow the movement of DS to different locations in the chromosome. And she could tell where DS was located because breaks at different places would give different colored kernels. And this experiment was set up in such a way that you could detect the break between I and SH, between SH and, and bronze, BZ, and between bronze and, and, and waxy. And uh, um, Barbara studied uh, the behavior of these transposable elements in this short region of the short arm of chromosome 9 for uh, a couple of decades and uh, learned an awful lot about what cells can do with their genomes and to their genomes. And uh, she ended uh, uh, she ended not by talking about DNA restructuring or transposition, but what it was that activated these elements in the first place. And she later repeated this experiment and activated a different element, and that was then repeated by somebody else. Uh, and um, uh, this is now solid science, although it has not been investigated as thoroughly as it should be. And she said, in the future, un attention undoubtedly will be centered on the genome with greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive organ of the cell. And then it's the cell that monitors genomic activities and corrects common errors, senses unusual and unexpected events, and responds to them, often by restructuring the genome. 
So this is definitely a cognitive view of what it is that leads to genome restructuring. And uh, um, it, it's really uh, amazing how much what Barbara found that people didn't believe for decades uh, was continually being rediscovered in different ways by the early molecular biologists. So Andre Lavoff in 1950 studied the phenomenon of lysogeny and showed that uh, certain strains of bacteria harbored viruses, viral genomes in their own genomes and could be induced to expre ex uh, express them. That's over uh, 62 years ago. And uh, one of the main uh, uh, lines of research that came out of that, of course, was studying how the provirus inserts into the genome and excises, and we now know that there are a number of different molecular mechanisms by which that can happen. But here you have DNA popping in and out of a genome and then altering the properties. For example, diphtheria does not cause diphtheria unless it has, it's lysogenic, it has a specific prophage in its genome which carries the coding sequence for diphtheria toxin. There's a man named Neil Groman who studied this in the early 1950s. Uh, genetic recombination between bacteria, uh, studied by my PhD supervisor <coughs> Bill Hayes, and then by Hayes in collaboration with Elie Volman and Francois Jacob in the 1950s, um, led to both the idea of plasmids, because Bill showed that the, the fertility, transmissible fertility factor uh, could replicate much faster than the, the bacteria themselves, and so it was independent. But Volman and Jacob emphasized the, the, what happened when the fertility factor integrated into the genome and led to transfer of chromosomal uh, markers. So again, you have pieces of DNA popping in and out and recombining uh, with each other. Uh, there was a lot of study of UV repair and mutagenesis, and it was eventually realized that uh, the mutagenesis was an active response of the cell. Uh, the clearest experiments on this were done by a man named Jean Weigley in the early 1950s. He was a Swiss physicist who followed Max Delbruck uh, to Caltech and to doing uh, bacteriophage genetics. Weigley used the fact that you had the viruses in suspension, you had basically the viral genome in isolation from a cell. And then you had the cells that could be infected, so you could look at what happens to both of them. And if you irradiate the virus and irradiate the bacteria and then infect the irradiated bacteria with the irradiated virus, you get a high frequency of mutations in the, uh, in the virus. If you don't irradiate the bacteria, you get much more killing of the virus and a much lower frequency of mutations, indicating that both repair and mutagenesis were inducible responses of the cell to the UV radiation. That's what's called the SOS response, which was finally sort of organized altogether by Evelyn Witkin in, in the mid-1970s. Weigley uh, uh, was very systematic. He was both Swiss and a physicist. <laughs> so he did unirradiated phage infecting both irradiated and unirradiated bacteria. And indeed he found that even if he didn't irradiate the phage but irradiated the cells, the phage DNA got mutagenized by induced activities of the cell. So mutation, and we now understand that this is due to the activity of a special class of DNA polymerases called lesion bypass mutator polymerases. So the cell is the active agent in the mutagenic process, and I think that would be very much in keeping with Lynn's ideas about cells. Uh, I talked about spontaneous mutation and replication proofreading. Oh, here's my cognitive slide, so I'll, I'll just show you 
I'll repeat that. Um, uh, we, we, uh, 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 I'll go into, I mentioned that already. Uh, and Jan mentioned, of course, the tremendous importance of antibiotic resistance plasmids, where we had not only a, a conventional theory of how resistance would arise by mutation, but it was an experimentally confirmed theory because people had gone into the laboratory and done the experiments and showed that by accumulating several mutations, you could get higher and higher levels of resistance. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way things happened in nature, and uh, Tetsumu Watsunabe and his Japanese collaborators were the first to point out that there were transmissible agents, which were plasmids, like the ones that Bill Hayes worked on, uh, that carried the antibiotic resistances and spread them through uh, populations. So this was the beginning of our understanding of horizontal DNA transfer. Uh, and then as people study bacteria and bacterial genomes more and more, the, 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 the modalities and the, 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 the uh, ubiquity of horizontal DNA transfer uh, became so clear that Sonet and Panacet in 1980 wrote a book in French that was translated into English in 83 called The New Bacteriology. We've seen Sonet and Mathieu, I think he was referred to Sonet and Mathieu, uh, and they said that basically there's a large distributed genome out there. It can be mobilized between cells, and when a new ecological niche opens up, the, the, the appropriate components of this distributed genome can be assembled within the cell so the cell can exploit the niche. And uh, that process goes on. We know it goes on because we have direct uh, molecular evidence of the transfer events and their consequences and their relationship with the ecology of the bacteria. Uh, there's still a lot we don't know about that and about how active or how passive the cells are in controlling the transfer process itself and in discriminating between what DNA they accept and don't accept. So that, there's still a lot of research to be done there. And then recently, um, in the 90s and in this uh, century, we've begun to learn about horizontal DNA transfer across kingdoms. So symbiogenesis is one way to mix genomes together, uh, but horizontal transfer uh, from uh, endosymbionts to their hosts and from the host to the endosymbionts is an ongoing process. I just talked to a, a colleague of mine who works on Legionella, bacteria which cause Legionella, Legionnaires disease or Legionella pneumonia. And it turns out that the proteins that Legionella uses to take control of the host cells during infections have been acquired from mammalian sources. They've been picked up. So bacteria can pick up mammalian DNA. We know there is the genome of a whole endosymbiotic bacteria in the, some fruit fly genome. So this kind of transfer goes on all the time, and there are functional things that have been transferred as well. So this was the slide that I thought I had earlier, I'm sorry, uh, to sh show the mismatch, the monitoring mute S protein binding to it, bringing in the mute L and mute H proteins, the mute H cuts the DNA, removes the new strand, and in this case, the bacteria use differential methylation to tell which is the old and which is the new strand. The, D, the, the incorrect DNA is removed, and then DNA is resynthesized so that the right base gets put opposite uh, that uh, template uh, base. So uh, that is, I would argue, a, a cognitive process. Now, All of these things, if we start to look at them, we have this whole array of cell functions, which is what I call natural genetic engineering. And I need to make a, a point before I go into the details about this. Uh, I call it natural genetic engineering because the DNA is being cut and spliced. And I said, well, it's like genetic engineering. And other people actually had used the term uh, before me. Uh, the, the evolutionary biologists and intelligent design people 
think of engineering as a, a, a directed process. And that hadn't occurred to me, but I gave a, a seminar at the Santa Fe Institute and Murray Gelman said, how can you have genetic engineering? You have to have an engineer. And as though this is bringing something forbidden into the process. Uh, and I, I don't think it is forbidden because as I've said, I think it's like what McClintock was talking about, a process where the cell senses and is in control of what's happening. So all cells have nucleases, polymerases, helicases, these enzymes that unwind DNA, and ligases, the, the, the enzymes that seal them together. There are these lesion bypass mutator polymerases, which are actually responsible for the so-called point mutations, which are interpreted as replication errors, but they actually require these polymerases to be in place to happen. There's homologous, or what used to be called legitimate recombination, the kind of recombination that we use for making genetic maps, the kind of recombination that's necessary for cells to go through uh, the two-step uh, process of meiosis. And then there's non-homologous end joining, the, the, the phenomenon that McClintock studied cyto cytogenetically, not molecularly. But then we have site-specific recombination, which as the name implies, involves special recombinases and special recombination sites. Uh, it's used to put viruses into chromosomes and take them out. There are structures called integrons, which are little platforms which have a site-specific recombinase to pick up cassettes for protein coding sequences, typically for antibiotic resistance or for other functions. There are super integrons, which are long structures like this, found in the genomes of many bacteria and coding pathogenicity and adherence factors and other functions needed to work as a pathogen. And there are these fascinating things called shufflons, where the recombination takes place inside of the coding sequences. And they're used by the bacteria to modify the structure of the surface proteins so that they can avoid the immune system or interact with different cell types. There's a whole variety of mobile gen genetic elements, the things that McClintock studied. There are ones that work at the level of DNA, called DNA transposons. There are ones that are like retroviruses. Remember, HIV, when it infects, goes into a chromosome. It's reverse transcribed into DNA and inserted into the chromosome. And there are retrotransposons, things which can't make virus particles, but can move from place to place within the genome that have a similar structure. And uh, uh, those are uh, very frequent. And then there are other kinds of retrotransposons called non-LTR. They don't have this characteristic LTR structure on the ends that the retroviruses have. Uh, and they're very <coughs> abundant in some organisms. They're our most abundant form of DNA in <coughs> genomes, as we'll see in a second. And, uh, of course, there, the, the variety of mechanisms that are involved, even within the DNA transposons, is quite amazing. And what you should do is just realize that these are mobile cassettes, which can be uh, clicked into the genome at different places. And that we understand the molecular biology down to the, 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 the phosphodiester bond level. And that these uh, elements have been used in evolution repeatedly. Uh, there was a paper published at the end of last year where the number of elements in the human genome that can be traced back to mobile elements is now over 280,000. Uh, if you compare the genetic differences between eutherian mammals and marsupials, over 20% of those are due to mobile elements which have then been modified and accepted or used for new functions. So these